So today I'm, I'm both honoured and delighted to have the opportunity to speak with the wonderful Steve Silberman. He's the author of Neurotribes, The Legacy of Autism and the Future of Neuro, Neurodiversity, which was chosen as one of the best books of 2015 by The New York Times, The Economist, The Financial Times and The Boston Globe, to name but a few. Um, it is currently being translated into 13 languages and a feature film uh, rights have been acquired by Paramount Studios. Steve has spoken about autism across the world and was chosen as keynote speaker at the United Nations on World Autism Day in 2016. Not only that, his TED Talk, The Forgotten History of Autism, has been viewed more than a million times to date. So again, I'm delighted to welcome Steve to the show. Hi, Steve, and a huge thank you for agreeing to come on the air today. Oh, thank you. I'm very thrilled to be on. I'm, I'm really glad you asked. Great, great. Listen, Steve, I'm going to get right through it because I've got loads of questions and I'm hoping that you'll be able to answer loads for me. Um, so sure. I suppose the very first question I have for you is where did your interest in autism come from? I know that you, you co-produced the Grateful Dead's records and that you've, you've um, achieved a gold record from the Recording Industry Association of America for the work on that. So why the move to autism? Yeah, well, that, that, that was the direction that I did not come from to write Duro Drives. I was the uh, senior science writer for Wired magazine for many, many years. And in uh, 2001, I wrote an article called The Geek Syndrome, which was one of the very first articles in the mainstream media to talk about uh, Asperger syndrome in high-tech communities like Silicon Valley. So in a sense, you know, the, the I've loved my work with The Grateful Dead, but it's kind of more like a hobby. Okay. My real job has been uh, being a science writer for uh, almost 20 years now, actually. And so that's the, that is where I acquired an interest in autism. It was actually seeing so many people who seem to be not necessarily diagnosably autistic, but at least, you know, somewhere on the infinite spectrum yeah. in Silicon Valley working in, in high tech. And uh, there were rumors back in 2000 when I wrote The Geek Syndrome that there was, quote unquote, an epidemic of autism yeah. in Silicon Valley. And, you know, there were all kinds of uh, reasons given for that. But that was really what interested me at first. OK. I was looking at that question. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. Now, I will touch base with you again shortly on the geek syndrome, but I'll keep going with my in, in chronological order for the moment, if that's OK. Sure. Um, can I ask yes, you, sure. I know I really enjoyed your TED Talk, The Forgotten History of Autism. Uh, I love the way you speak mm -hmm. so passionately and so positively. How did this opportunity right. arise? And will you tell my listeners a little bit about what it's about and about, the, I suppose, the, the, the history in general of autism? Well, I, uh, there's sort of a story at the heart of my book, Neurotribes, that the world did not know because I was the person who discovered that it happened, which was that... Um, the true discoverer of autism was not Leo Connor, uh, this um, child psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins Hospital, as it has been said, you know, in hundreds of textbooks and Wikipedia and everything for so many years. I discovered that really the, the true discoverers of autism were Hans Asperger and his colleagues at the University of Vienna in the 1930s, even before Leo Connor. Uh, and then, in fact, one of Asperger's assistants went to uh, America to escape the Holocaust and helped Leo Connor uh, to discover autism. So that was such an important history because unlike Leo Connor, who insisted that autism was rare, Asperger and his colleagues uh, believed that autism was very common. And in fact, Asperger said, once you learn to recognize the distinctive traits of autism, you see them everywhere. Absolutely. And so... You know, that raises the question of why did Asperger think it was common and Connor think it was rare? And, you know, that ended up having a huge effect on how we perceive autism today. So it was such an important story sort of at the center of the book that I thought I should tell it, you know, uh, if there was one thing that you took away from the book, it was knowing this, that autism was once believed to be common. And then because of World War II, uh, it ended up, uh, you know, mistakenly uh, being believed to think it was rare. Yeah. So uh, the way that I told that story was that um, I had been in a, a kind of a live event called Pop-Up Magazine in San Francisco. And it was sort of like mini TED Talks in a way, except even more multimedia. And so I did one of those, and then Pop-Up got invited to TED to do talks there. And so I just got a call one day, do you want to do, you know, a pop-up like thing at TED? 
Fab. And so, of course, I did. <laughs> Fab, fab. I thought that would be a very important message to put out. Uh, absolutely. I'm actually glad that they, they contacted you and that you decided to, to go forward yeah. and do the TED Talk, do you know? Um, I spoke, yeah. we, we actually only had a conversation here, myself and the studio man- manager, while I was waiting to ring you. And we were talking about individuals that we passed as we were coming to the studio. Um, and uh, like how easy when you when you have your eyes open and when you when you're so used to living with autism that how easy it is to see those little nuances, those little um, vocal tics or those little um, to- intonations in in people's speech that you'd automatically turn and kind of go, oh, I wonder. Do you know, so it is it is. Yes, I know. Well, you know, uh, gay people talk about having, quote unquote, gaydar, which is how they, you know, sort of pick each other out in a, in a, you know, in the general public, they have a, an intuitive sense. And yeah. my autistic friends talk about Otdar. Yeah, that uh, actually makes complete yep. sense. <laughs> yep, yep. It does. Um, tell me, Steve, how do you feel about the changes to the DSM-5 now, that, namely the removal of Asperger's syndrome? Well, here's the thing. Um, <clears throat> it, it wasn't any kind of grand theoretical decision, you know, the, to exclude uh, people with Asperger's from the spectrum or something like that. Quite the contrary. It, it was a decision that was made uh, on an almost purely bureaucratic basis uh, because people who got different codes uh, from the DSM on their diagnosis would have different access to services depending on what geographical area you lived in, which is obviously not right. Obviously, you know, if you have a condition, you deserve the same level of support no matter where you live. And so uh, a very honest psychiatrist once said to me, the DSM is not really about diagnosis. It's about reimbursement, you know. And okay. So okay. If you live in a place without national health care, like America, um, you need these codes to access these services. So mm-hmm. one thing that most people don't know, it's actually kind of, I wish it was bigger news, really, was that for the first time in history, uh, when, they, when they compiled the DSM-5, they consulted autistic adults. Great. And uh, members of a group here in America called the Autistic Self Advocacy Network, or ASAN, which is an excellent group. And ASAN made recommendations so that no one would lose their diagnosis because of the changes, and so that um, women and minorities would uh, be more uh, accurately represented in the numbers Great. because of the cri- diagnostic criteria. So it's actually, I'm not against it. You know, okay. I, I think it was really a bureaucratic decision to make sure that people got equitable access to services and the criteria was actually informed by autistic adults, okay. which I think is great. Well, definitely. It's always good to have an autistic voice in amongst all yeah. of all of that bureaucracy, as you say. Um, Steve, yep, uh, exactly. following on from that then, um, I know that you've been vocal in the past about how you feel um, terms like high functioning and low functioning are terms that we should be phasing out. Will you explain to my listeners why you believe this? Yeah, sure. I understand what people mean by using those terms, certainly. Um, obviously, you know, uh, as an autistic person once said to me, autistic people are more different from each other than they are from neurotypicals who are, yeah. you know, people without autism. And that's really true. I mean, some autistic people can't talk at all. Some autistic people need uh, support really almost 24-7 yeah. in their lives. Other autistic people can work at Google, you know. So it, it, it looks like a very heterogeneous population. But the problem is that when you start sorting people into binary categories like high-functioning and low-functioning, well, it turns out that uh, high-functioning people have a lot of problems because they, they face a lot of stress because they're expected to perform well and they're expected to blend in. Yeah you know, to a neurotypical world without much accommodation. And in fact, they end up with extreme uh, anxiety and depression. And in fact, you know, one of the most serious problems for autistic adults is suicide. And suicide rates are higher among people who are, uh, you know, allegedly considered high functioning. So how high functioning is that, you know, if you're considering suicide? Absolutely. And at the same time, yeah, and at the same time, low-functioning people, you know, quote-unquote, low-functioning people, if you give them, say, you know, a keyboard or a system of uh, doing, you know, sign language or some alternate means of communication, they often turn out to have more capabilities than they appeared yeah. to have when they did not have access to that means of communication. So some, you know, quote-unquote, low-functioning people 
are incredibly talented and, and, you know, they don't have to be geniuses or anything, but they just have more capability than it appears from the outside. So I just avoid those labels because I think they're dehumanizing and inaccurate. Good, good. I'm glad you say that because I know that I, I'm forever arguing with people here about um, about high functioning, low functioning. I, oftentimes parents are told that actually your, your son or daughter is high functioning, so therefore he'll be fine. When in fact, I know yeah, right. in our in our family um, circumstance, I have found that uh, people that would have been considered very high functioning um, have have broken down under the pressure and that actually, in my opinion, Somebody that is high functioning is somebody that um, that accesses pleasant uh, like pleasure in their lifetime. It doesn't matter. Uh, it, people tend to link it with intellectual ability rather than actual functioning. And high functioning is the ability to enjoy your life and to be present and to enjoy what you're involved in or doing. Do you know? So I'm glad wow, you said that. Wow, that's a beautiful that. way to say it. Do you know? I will. I will remember uh, that you said it that way because it's a. It's a really beautiful way to conceive of it. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, tell me, uh, Steve, before I tell, before I have you tell everybody all about your book, the Neurotribe, uh, Neurotribes book, will you explain to my listeners a little bit about the, what the concept of neurodiversity is? Sure. Uh, the concept of neurodiversity was developed by a grad student in Australia named Judy Singer. She was part of a, one of the earliest online groups for autistic adults. Uh, and I, I've looked at the activity in those groups, and they're really profound because at the time, the idea that uh, adults, and particularly adults with jobs and marriages and things, could be autistic was considered, you know, very new, if not, uh, you know, uh, radical. And so a lot of times these people had to figure out for themselves that they were still autistic after they'd been diagnosed as children. So they would ask each other, like, do you think... You know, is it possible that autism lasts until adulthood? Yeah. Because it was still considered a childhood condition. So anyway, so they started talking, and they were just talking about their lives, as, as one does, you know, online. And they sort of figured out that um, some of their problems were not, you know, symptoms of their autism or caused by their autism, but they were really caused by a society that was failing to provide for their needs. Yeah. So they started to think about, well, you know, all the words that we have to describe ourselves are uh, kind of, you know, medicalizing yeah. and negative words. So it's like, you know, I have this syndrome, I have these symptoms, I have these impairments, I have these deficits. You know, it's like if you look at autism history, the phrase deficits yeah. and impairments, you know, just comes up everywhere. And so they started to kind of ask themselves, well, is there some way to think about who we are that it doesn't involve automatically putting us down? And so Judy coined the term neurodiversity, um, talking with another uh, writer named Harvey Bloom, at basing that word on the word biodiversity. So like in a rainforest, if you have lots of different kinds of life forms living together, that community is more resilient in the face of unexpectedly changing conditions. So they thought, what if a community of human minds is the same way? And people who think differently working together makes for a more powerful and resilient community than all, you know, the same kind of people. And, you know, something that you hear a lot in the corporate world is, well, you know, we hire real team players and people who are like us. Like, I hear that all the time in Silicon Valley. You know, what if that's completely wrong? What if it's better to hire people who are not like you so they can see problems from different angles? than you're able to see. And Temple Grandin has made that point many times in her own work, uh, that her work as a as an engineer and a, and a designer of facilities for uh, livestock is actually assisted by her autism. It's not yeah. in spite of her autism. And so um, they coined the term neurodiversity, hoping that it would sort of empower uh, the marginalized communities of people with autism, people with ADHD, people with dyslexia, people who think differently in the same way that positive slogans like black is beautiful or sisterhood is powerful okay. empowered marginalized communities in the 70s. Great, great. Um, I suppose it's really, really, it's really good to hear somebody speak about the, the positives and the strengths that people with all different levels of capacity can bring to 
an environment. And actually, I, I didn't I didn't know the story fully behind it. I love the concept that, that Judy and Harvey brought about with mm. this, this neurodiversity. I suppose for me as well, the other thing I picked up on with you, Steve, is that you're speaking about the medicalising um, language that we use, the kind of the deficit, the impairment. And the, um, as an aside, do you find that the language that we're using is starting to change, starting to move away from that, that um, impairment or deficit basis? Oh, I do. And, you know, I think the, the term neurodiversity sort of carries that revelation with it. And, you know, there's an interesting thing about my book, which is that in England, it has a different subtitle. It's called um, uh, Neurotypes of Legacy of Autism and How to Think Smarter About People Who Think Differently, which I, I must say I find that title rather cumbersome. But um, the reason why they didn't put the word neurodiversity in the title was because they'd never heard of it as okay. a publisher, you know. And so I said, well, you should really use it because it's a really powerful concept and it will be really popular very soon, you know. Yeah. But they didn't believe me. Um, but it really is spreading good news good. for parents uh, and for autistic people who have been told their whole lives not to expect anything good. Yeah. You know, like par- parents are, you know, I spoke to many parents who were told, when their kid was diagnosed, that it was a fate worse than death, and you just have to learn to bear it, and, you know, all this horrible, horrible mm. messaging. Uh, and, um, and you know, of course, even though in the past, the fact that autistic people themselves were getting those messages wasn't even considered, you know, it was just like parents and teachers would carry that thought around. And it's very, very uh, disempowering. Yeah. It, it leads people to not give autistic people the chance to thrive, that they deserve to not make accommodations that would give them opportunities that would really help them uh, put their lives on track. And so, you know, it's not just a matter of like saying nice things about people. It actually, uh, how you think about conditions like autism and dyslexia really affects the opportunities that you offer to young people with those conditions. And so it's, it's a world transforming idea. And I, I consider myself lucky actually that I was able to, uh, use it uh, in a title and then write about the history of the idea uh, and to be the first one to do it because uh, it's such a powerful idea that it really has changed the world yeah. even in the uh, just couple of years since my book was published. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm actually going to, I'm going to move off base for a second and I'm actually going to move on to a different question just on the basis of what you've just said. I know that some people speak sure. about finding a cure for autism, Steve. Um, I know as an autism parent myself, I find it actually very upsetting sometimes to hear about the lengths that people go to. They, like, they talk about um, using bleach enemas or just, it just even words like a person that is less than and do you know the impact that that has on an individual with autism? I see it in my house every day, this, this, I suppose, the, the impact that negative words can have because they're not just commenting on the autism. Um, a person with autism takes it as, 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 as them commenting on them as people too. Uh, what's your opinion on this move towards kind of cure and clearing out autism as being, like, as being something that is in need of a cure? Well, here's the thing. I understand where the idea comes from because parents, you know, see their child apparently suffering, see their child unable to speak, unable to ask for, uh, you know, even basic things like going to the bathroom or a meal. So, you know, that uh, looks very, very difficult. It indeed is very difficult. And so I think it's kind of almost natural for parents at the beginning of the process to wish that they could just make it all go away and then have a child who didn't have autism instead. The problem is then you're not um, making the world better for the child that you have. And um, unfortunately, the parents of autistic children have been sort of subject to so many false hopes, uh, mm. hysterical headlines, scams. You know, you go to these conventions of anti-vaccine people yeah. and they have, you know, sauna baths and camel milk and um, you know, all these compounds that yeah. turn out to be either useless or harmful, like, like in the case of the bleach. Uh, the bleach is, is it's just horrifying. Yeah. And, you know, you see these secret Facebook groups where people are posting photographs of what are allegedly, you know, parasites that they've killed with this bleach. They're not parasites. You know, you hear about the kids vomiting or having diarrhea because of the treatment. It's, it's torture, yeah. you know, yeah. and I'm very, very um, 
proud uh, and admiring of campaigners like Emma Delmaine, uh, who's in the UK somewhere, I forget exactly where, but she's been a very vocal uh, voice. She's not just an autism mom, she's an autistic mom. And she's been a very, very vocal voice uh, against these quack cures, yeah. which, you know, autism is expensive. You know, there's yeah. no way around that. And uh, to have parents spending, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a month on these useless treatments, uh, and it's, you know, worse than useless because you're giving the kid the message that unless they can be fixed, they're broken. Yeah. You know, and that's a message that even nonverbal kids can can uh, internalize. And so, um, you know, I, I, parents have to, uh, you know, make peace with the fact that they have the child that they have. And I know that, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to be in the position of giving anyone advice, but if you're spending money on unproven treatments because you saw, you know, a website or a link on Facebook or something, you're not doing either you or your kid a favor yeah. at all. Yeah. And, and um, there, there are many, many positive steps you can take. Yeah. So, uh, you know, giving your kid bleach or worms or saunas, you know, it's just, it's not, you know, it's just not good. Good, good. Um, Steve, I'll go back on track again. Um, so I'm going to come yeah. back to your book. Um, will you take me through the process of writing Neural Tribes, where it came from, how long it took? And just for those listeners that haven't had the opportunity yet to read it, um, just a little bit about some of the concepts. And now coming back to the geek syndrome, like, like concepts like that geek syndrome in Silicon Valley and all that. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Um, so I wrote the article, The Geek Syndrome, in 2001. And, uh, you know, I was a senior science writer for Wired. So, um, you know, I just went on after the article came out and went on to other subjects. And um, I did end up writing about autism a couple of times more for Wired. But the main thing that happened that really changed my life was that for about 10 years after Geek Syndrome came out, it came out just before 9-11 in 2001. And yeah. so for 10 years after Geek Syndrome came out, I got email from autistic people and their families talking about the challenges in day-to-day -day life that they were facing. So yeah. they were very basic challenges like not, you know, being able to uh, get a diagnosis for your child or being able to, un unable to find a job if you were an autistic adult. Yeah. And meanwhile, the whole society around me was kind of becoming obsessed with autism, but it was becoming obsessed with a different question. The question was, do vaccines cause autism? Yeah. And so if there was ever an article uh, in a newspaper about autism, even if it had nothing to do with vaccines, um, you know, the comment section would be like, it's vaccines. You yeah. know? And if you yeah. said it wasn't vaccines, you'd be accused of being a shill for big pharma, you know? Yeah. And so um, I thought, when did the uh, interests and concerns of the mainstream culture about autism, which was, you know, were mostly centered around vaccines, and the concerns of the people on the front lines of autism, that is, you know, autistic uh, people and their parents, yeah. um, when did they diverge, you know, so much so that the, all the mainstream media wants to talk about is vaccines? And so I started to think that there was something that a myth about autism history, like something had gone wrong somewhere in autism history, like, you know, and uh, so I started to dig and dig and dig. And what I discovered was what I talked about in my TED talk. Um, and also I, I just, I went from writing a sort of scientific book about, you know, what, you know, what causes in the human genome, you know, uh, trigger autism. I, I ended up writing a more sort of a social justice book yeah. about what I felt was a, a new kind of civil rights uh, movement really taking place before my eyes. Uh, young autistic people who were suddenly empowered uh, with the idea of neurodiversity and a sense of their own um, a bit, you know, potential, yeah. really, were banding together to change the mind of society about what autistic people were capable of. And I thought that was so beautiful. So it ended up being, you know, it's still kind of a, a history of medicine book, but it's also a book about the birth of a new kind of civil yeah. rights movement. 
Well, I yeah. suppose one of the one of my favourite parts, um, excluding your own stuff, is Oliver's uh, Oliver Sacks forward. Steve, I love oh, the yeah. way he stated. Like, I actually wrote it down to say it because I feel it's very important that people hear it. Is that I know of no one else who has spent so much time simply listening and trying to understand what it's like to be autistic. That is the that is what brought the power to your book. It is you, the time that you, you gave, and it is that 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 passion that you felt around wanting to ensure that that the the autistic voice was heard so well done you is all I'd say on that I I, I feel that his, his, his words were just they hit the nail on the head as the way I'd put it um well he, he was also a huge uh you know influence and inspiration for yeah. the book yeah. because he really his uh for instance his essay about Temple Grandin yeah. an anthropologist on Mars it was so groundbreaking it was fantastic. why because he looked at her as a human being yeah. instead of as a case that's exactly know? it um steve yeah. tell me yeah. in chapter 9 i know you discussed the rain man effect um now tell me stereotypical stereotypical portrayals of autism like dustin hoffman's r- role in rain man um although i think they were hugely helpful in mainstreaming the word autism. I actually reckon that they've served to kind of create that stereotyped understanding of autism in society, that all people with autism are challenged cognitively, but that have savant type skills in one area or another. Is there any other portrayal that you would be happy to share as a positive representation of an individual oh, with sure. Asperger's well, syndrome? I mean, the one, yeah, sure. I mean, the one thing to remember... I'm not as down on Rain Man as some. Oh uh, no, no. Are. Right, because I think it was no. so. It was it. Right, it was the first glimpse, really, that people had. Absolutely. Of an autistic adult, you know. Yep, yep. But the thing I would say is that uh, Claire Danes' portrayal of Temple Grandin in, in the biographical yeah. film made uh, 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 of Temple Grandin's life, she it was such a sensitive portrayal, and it it captured uh, you know everything. Temple's genius, Temple's yeah. feistiness. Um, I, I thought that was a really, really sensitive portrayal. And now what's happening, you know, there are shows like Atypical yeah. and The Good Doctor that have central characters who are autistic. One thing that I think is very good that's happening is that these shows are taking on autistic advisors good. to help them make the portrayals even more true to life and kind of lived through from the inside. Good. And uh, I think that's a very positive development. Great, great. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'll recommend, actually, I've seen that, that movie as well. And Claire Danes is, she's, she's absolutely excellent uh, when she plays yeah. her role as, as Temple. She's absolutely fantastic. And I know the Temple herself yeah. speaks very positively and really, really appreciated the way in which Claire represented her. Do you know? So that'd yeah. be important as and, well. And, you know, I think Temple is just a wonderful person. Oh, I have amazing. To say. I mean, I know sometimes she says controversial things, but being outspoken is her nature yeah. and it's part of autism really, you yeah. know? Um, and, uh, but she is just such a, such a strong and vivid and funny and, you know, brilliant uh, person. Yeah. I love spending time with her. Yeah. I had the pleasure of meeting her last year, just very briefly. Um, she was here in Ireland, a uh, discussing autism and giving um, different lectures at different conferences over the space of a week. So I had the, the pleasure, as I say, very briefly of meeting her one of the highlights of my year, I must say so. Um, tell yeah. me, Steve, with regards to the history of autism, oh no, sorry, I must come back, um, with regards to neurotribes, um, I know it was awarded, um, hu- it received a huge number of awards, one of which was the Samuel D- Johnson Award in 2015. How did you feel when you saw this wealth of positive, inf- uh, positive feedback for your book? Well, you know, I'll be very blunt here. I was completely and totally surprised because the whole time that I was writing the book, I was absolutely stressed out because you know how how much infighting there is in the world of autism. Yeah. And, you know, parents uh, fight with self-advocates, self-advocates fight with clinicians, nobody trusts each other, everybody's sending out these mean tweets, you know. And so I thought, I'm, I felt like I was, you know, sort of gradually lowering myself into a meat grinder, you know, like yeah. the, the book took five years to... Right, and that was after many years of thinking. And the whole time I was like waking up at three three in the morning, you know, in a cold sweat, thinking that I was writing a book that not only everyone would hate, but that would mean the end of my sort of oh successful my career as a science writer. And so when the book came out, actually I, I will tell you this, the very first person to read the book all the way through, and I mean before my 
this was before my spouse and before my editor was um, Oliver Sacks's assistant, Kate Edgar, who used to edit Oliver. And so I thought, well, you know, if anybody is capable of reading this book with a critical eye, it's Kate, you know. And so I sent her a copy of the book. And I, you know, it was kind of tense, you know, I didn't know if she would like it or, you know, she'd come back with, you know, changes it was too late to make or, you know, whatever. And um, I remember what happened. I woke up in the morning and there were like 20 messages, uh, text messages on my phone. Okay. And they were from Kate, who had stayed up all night oh, wow. reading the book. Fab. And it, uh, by the way, I've never told this story in public, I have to say. Um, and, uh, you know, at various points, like three in the morning, you know, she would be like in tears now reading about oh, wow. you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I thought, wow, maybe this book, good, <laughs> good. people will like it. You know? yeah. Fab. So you had that wonderful insight before you went to press, which was great. Good. Yep. God. Yep. Yeah, it was, it, it was a load off my mind. A five-year load. Oh off my, my God! Mind. Oh my goodness! Yeah. I can I can only imagine the panic. I wouldn't. I don't think I'd have the 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 strength to be dealing with that kind of stress. Um, no, I know. <laughs> well, well, it did. You know, I mean, it took a load on my health. I'll tell you. But, yeah. You know, we all survived. And, you and know, you're here to so. live the, and tell tell the tale of Kate Edgar exactly. looking at it in the middle yeah. of the night. Great, great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tell me, Steve, on a different a different route. Um, genetics. Um, I believe that understanding genetics involved in autism definitely will create a better understanding of the autistic individual and how they function. Um, now, I am a little bit concerned again that such knowledge might lead to selection processes down the road in the future. Um, it does seem to be, in my opinion in a little bit of a double-edged sword. What do you think of it all? Well, uh, yes, I agree with you, but I, I also think that... Um, I agree with you that it's a double-edged sword, but I also think there's a little bit of overreaction uh, on various sides, and I'll tell you what I mean. Okay. Some understanding of autism genetics will help uh, scientists, for example, solve the problem of epilepsy in autism. Yeah. Epilepsy is a very serious problem in autism. Now, it's not necessarily, you know, we, we could argue for hours about, you know, is epilepsy a part of autism or is it a comorbidity, as they say? You know, we could argue about that, but in a way it doesn't matter. Yeah. What does matter is that a lot of autistic adults have epilepsy and they can die of it. It's, yeah. it's one of the leading causes of death among autistic adults is epilepsy. And so one way that uh, the pharmaceutical industry will be able to develop uh, drugs, you know, new targets in the brain to, to develop drugs for is by doing autism genetic research and by looking at the basic mechanisms of how autism works in the brain. Am I against that? No. no. It's, you know, it's life-saving research. The problem is if this work ends up producing a prenatal test for autism and that's, you yeah. know, that's the main focus and, you know, then you'll end up with a situation like we have in Finland now where they brag about not having Down syndrome yeah, yeah. because they abort, you know, all the babies that come up with Down syndrome, the chromosome changes. Yeah. And that is, you know, it's eugenics. Uh, it's, it's terrible. And as Temple Grandin says, if we were to rid the world of autistic people, uh, you know, not only would that be a genocide, but uh, a lot of positive qualities that the world needs seem to be a, a sort of genetic fellow travelers in the gene pool with autism. So we could be getting rid of a lot of things that civilization needs yeah. to face the future together. Absolutely. And so I am cautious, but I don't think that saying that, you know, uh, autism should not be studied scientifically or medically, I don't think that's the way to go either yeah. because um, there's stuff like anxiety and epilepsy and we need new uh, treatments for those. Yeah. And so... That, you know, I think that's important. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah. Tell me, Steve, how do you what do you feel has led to the change in opinions around um, around and the treatment of autism in society over the past few decades? Do you think it's because of the media well, portrayals or parental voice or a combination or something else entirely? Well, parents really, um, you know, were the main force, I would say, for raising autism in the public consciousness. Uh, when it was just kids who were being diagnosed. Yeah. Like the, the parents that I wrote about in Neurotribes, uh, like Ruth Sullivan, uh, Ruth Chris Sullivan, um, 
they were leaders in not just uh, fighting for rights for their autistic children, but really uh, leaders in disability rights and disability accommodations. Yeah. And they got, for instance, the law in America that entitles uh, all kids, even disabled kids, to a, to a, uh, a, a free and appropriate public education. Yeah. And so they're heroes in, in my book. And um, so I think that in the first wave, it was really parents who kind of overturned some of the truly heinous ideas that clinicians had, like, you know, for, as a, for a long time, as many people know, clinicians mistakenly blamed parents for causing autism yeah. in their children, uh, so-called refrigerator mothers. That was horrifying, you yeah. know. And so parents really fought for to keep their kids at home, to not put them in institutions, yeah. which was like a death sentence, basically, for, uh, you know, for kids. So um, parents were the real heroes uh, in the first wave of history, I would say. Good. And then, you know, in more recent times, autistic self-advocates Absolutely. have made their voices heard in social media. And uh, one thing I'm very happy about is that when I started writing Neurotribes, um, because I'd written about autism before, I would occasionally get called, you know, by news reporters. And I would say, like, well, have you talked to any autistic adults? And they would say, like, oh, I didn't think of that. You know, and it's like, well, you know, think about it. What, what if you were writing an article about you know, women in the workplace, and you interviewed only men. Exactly. You know, like that. Yeah, doctor, yeah. You know? So uh, I'm very happy to see that now when there's an article about autism, you know, they will often, like, talk to an autistic adult or two, which is a very good thing that needs to be encouraged. And that really changes uh, the whole framing of the social conversation around autism because we, uh, we are no longer talking about autism behind the backs of autistic yeah. people. Yeah. You know, you know, we're wel- welcoming them welcoming them into the conversation. And so I think that's what's happening now is that autistic people are really leading the way Good. to uh framing autism in a much more humane way. And so, you know, if you ha- like something just happened yesterday. Um, you know, a prominent uh, doctor published an article and some tweets saying that uh electronic healthcare records were uh, autistic because they lacked, you know, empathy and compassion and stuff. And uh, what happened was a bunch of autistic people took issue with that, and I took issue with that, and he ended up retracting the tweet and apologizing good, good. and saying that he's still learning. So that that's good. You know, that's change happening in front of our eyes. Good, good. Actually, it is. And, you know, I think that's definitely one of the most positive steps forward at the moment is that people with autism do have a voice and that it is starting to be heard. Do you know? Yep, exactly. Exactly. Um, And that's what I hope, you know, that's what I hope the legacy of my book is, actually, is to help uh, center autistic voices. That's why it's very much, um, you know, it kind of leads up to the introduction of autistic adults, the narrative of the book. And I I thought of the autistic adults and autistic self-advocates uh, in my book, is sort of the cavalry that arrives at the end. You know, after all this horrible yeah. stuff, you know, concentration camps and electric shock and everything, you know, you sort of have these uh, autistic adults proudly talking about who they are and what's important to them and what they need. Yeah. And so I felt like they really make my book have a kind of redemptive arc. Absolutely. Uh, and so I'm very grateful to them. Absolutely. Um, tell me, Steve, as for intervention, um, I know that I find that any inter- individualised intervention working with a person's strengths is beneficial and de- definitely helps him or her to realise their potential. What's your opinion on intervention? Um, do you believe that it should always be individualised or would you be happy to see people follow a generalised um, intervention theme or whatever? Oh, I think it, it very much needs to be individualised. And I sort of avoid, you know, I'm often, like, I generally, to tell you the truth, avoid answering this question. Okay, in okay. In part because, no, I mean, I'm happy to do it. I, I'll explain why. In part because I feel like blanket statements, you know, yeah. intervention is good. Or yeah. intervention yeah. is not good, you know. Uh, that it, it, it sort of decides the point and possibly harmful. But it really has to do with the person, what they need, yeah. and then the the therapist, you know. And if you find a therapist that you feel respects your child's needs, respects your child's autonomy, is giving your child, uh, you know, tools in a sense uh, to become more autonomous and to express their 
you know, desires, hopes, and dreams, that's good. You know, yeah. if you, if you, you know, if you meet a therapist who appears to be mostly interested in changing behavior, you know, through punishment or whatever, avoid, yeah. you know, cause it's really traumatic. Um, one book that, that I would very much recommend for parents who are, who are thinking about intervention is a book called Uniquely Human by Barry Prezant, P-R-I-Z-A-N-T. He has been doing, um, a non-ABA uh, form of intervention called CERT uh, for a very long, for decades, really. Yeah. And he really respects autistic people. And it's a way of thinking about, you know, as he puts it, it's not autistic behavior, it's human behavior, okay. you know? Yeah. And so he, he is a way of looking at, you know, really difficult behavior issues like self-injury in a way that's very respectful uh, to the autistic person, and uh, I would very much recommend that book. And tell me, did you say, Steve, that he's he discusses the CERTS the CERTS uh, yes. programs? S C E R T S. Correct. Okay. No, just just as an aside, I know that I I've actually signed up for training um, on a oh, CERTS great. program in March of 2019. Um, and just to let any listeners know that Middletown Centre for Autism, um, based cross border based both between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, are offering this training between the 20th and the 22nd of March. Places are very limited, but if people wanted to contact the Middletown Centre for Autism and see was there any availability on the course, it might be worth looking into so no that's that's great thank you that's great to to know that i'm on the right track myself good good yeah that's great that's great um can i ask you steve um you've spoken mostly in the past about the importance of neurodiversity in the classroom not just for children on the spectrum but actually for the learning of all children will you explain what this would look like in a class and the benefits to it for any educational practitioners that would be listening and well sure you know one of the things that we can do now because of digital technology, is that we can uh, allow students to access a core curriculum uh, in a way that is more individually customized to suit their needs. Okay. So that some students are, you know, text-based learners, others are, you know, listening-based learners, uh, others are visual learners, and we can adapt curriculum using, uh, you know, tablets and iPads and whatnot in a way that previous generations never could. And yeah. so, so that's a good thing. There are some very simple uh, sensory accommodations that can be used to uh, eliminate, you know, kind of overload and meltdown, everything from personal headphones to, uh, you know, if you can set aside uh, a room, uh, like a chill room, you know, yeah. where kids can uh, chill out, you know, if they feel overwhelmed. Those are just little things that, that really help. You know, uh, perhaps having you know, quieter uh, hand dryers in the bathroom instead of those roaring monsters. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it's also really just, uh, I would say, one of the most important changes that could be made is that instead of focusing on correcting deficits, focus on supporting strengths. Because one of the worst misconceptions about autism back in the early days was that uh, Leo Connor tended to think that even the strengths uh, that were evident in some of his patients were pathological. So that, okay. you know, one of his kids could recognize 18 symphonies before he turned two. So instead of thinking like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. You know, what Leo thought was that the kid was desperately trying to um, kind of engage the interest of his parents, you know. Yeah. And uh, so... It's time to stop thinking of the interests of autistic people as inherently pathological. Uh, yes, it may get a little boring at times to hear about. You know, yes, it may seem like they're not doing anything else, but, you know, reading about uh, Harry Potter or whatever, uh, or Pokemon. But um, those interests can be used as platforms to build a path into a more successful life. And there's both a book and a movie uh, that very much demonstrates this called Life Animated by Ron Suskind. Um, His kid lost speech uh, when he was a child, as many, you know, autistic children do. They lose speech for a while. But then Ron had this idea of contacting uh, his son through his interest in Disney. So he started speaking uh, to his son in the voice of Disney characters. And lo and behold his son would start completing sentences yeah. 
in yeah. character. And that was how his son started talking again. Yeah. So special interest in young autistic people is often the beginning of their own individual path through life. And cool. so I think that's something that could be taught in schools by making, uh, well, here they're called individualized education programs or yeah. IEPs. Um, and IEPs should always list strengths and interests and areas of potential as well as you know, Johnny has trouble with blah, 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 or Jane has a deficit and blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's absolutely, that's great advice actually for any, because we have IEPs here in Ireland as well, where uh, schools yeah. ordinarily meet parents at the end of September and again around February time to discuss how to move forward and to ensure that the child yeah. is is achieving, I suppose. But definitely the strengths and interests basis of anything is definitely the way to move forward, in my opinion, too. Do you know? Yeah. Um, Steve, yeah. on a wider scale, um, how do we need to change as a society to ensure that the needs of people on the spectrum are met? Well, you know, I don't want to get too much into American politics at this point yeah. in history, but I will say that there is a uh, there is a drift. In, it's a terrible thing in American society right now where people who are identified as other or different yeah are considered scary or, you know, we have to put them in a detention center or, you know, limit in immigration. I mean, that's exactly what prevented Jews from being able to escape the Holocaust, yeah. as I write about in my book, actually. And so we have to start thinking of people who are different from us as worthy human beings who deserve the chance to live a creative and satisfying life. And, uh, you know, that's at the level of race. It's at the level of sexual orientation, it's at the level of gender, and it's at the level of neurology. And I think if we take a compassionate view that everyone is a human being trying as best they can, um, that, you know, we will naturally want to build structures into society that helps everyone realize their maximum potential. Okay. So in the very broadest sense, that, I think, is the message of neurodiversity. Yeah. Um, and there are many forms of diversity. You know, you go to a city like New York, there are so many different kinds of people. Uh, I mean, it's, New York is becoming more, you know, wealthy like many places, but, you know, it's lots of different kinds of people with lots of different kinds of ethnic, racial, sexual, yeah. neurological backgrounds, you know, all like in this, you know, this big stew, like trying, you know, trying to, trying to live together in a positive way. And that is the future. The future is not isolating ourselves and, you know, behind these walls, so to speak, um, uh, and, you know, tr trying to oppress everyone who's not like us because we're scared that they're taking over the world. You know, who's taking yeah. over the world is human beings. <laughs> and we all need each other's help. Good. Um, tell me, so in, in keeping with the show's ethos, I suppose, Steve, uh, for not only creating awareness, but also about it, like the show would be about offering support. What's the most important piece of advice you could firstly give to educational professionals who, who are dealing regularly with individuals on the autism spectrum? Believe in the potential of, of uh, the people you're teaching, really. You know, believe that believe that that uh, given the right tools for communication and the right uh, kinds of emotional support and sensory support that they could live up to be the best version of themselves and that that's a very worthy goal for you as an educator is to help them do that. Fabulous. I, that's actually gorgeous. I, I'm, I'm writing that as you're speaking. I love it. Uh, to just believe Thanks. in the potential of the people that you're teaching. That is the, the yeah. perfect message for any educator, I think. Um, tell me Thank what... You. What advice would you give? It like, okay, so I suppose in keep, given that I'm based here in University College Cork, I suppose it's important to ask on behalf of the autistic in, is autistic student community. What supports do you recommend? Firstly, for an for an adult and an, sorry, an adolescent with autism who's moving from a school setting to a uni to a university. Um, do you have well, any two things? I, I would say two things are really important. One is a community of fellow neurodivergent people. Okay. So, uh, you know, student neurodiversity organizations that include, you know, dare I say, neurotypical people like me, you know, okay. as well as autistic people and people with dyslexia um, and uh, other, you know, uh, depression, bipolar. Um, a, a community of support is really important. Another thing that's really important, I think, 
is to have uh, artistic peer mentoring okay. going on uh, in school so that you're working with older kids who have sort of figured out the system and can help you navigate, uh, you know, in, in the academic bureaucracy. That's really important. Also, uh, adult autistic role models okay. from outside the um, institution. You know, so bring in autistic writers like Temple Grandin or John Elder Robeson uh, to talk about, um, you know, what it's like to be a middle-aged person or even an elderly person with okay. autism. Because we know so little about what helps elderly autistic people survive and thrive and be happy. And that's such an important message for young autistic people is you can do it. Yeah. You know, you can live to be 60 yeah. and, and have, a, have a really creative and engaged life. And, you know, I would say the one lesson that I kept learning over and over again while I was writing my book, you know, I would talk to parents. And I would hear about the terrible predictions that would be being made, you know, all the way back to the beginning from yeah. the very first group of kids who were diagnosed with autism, you know, um, one of them, you know, definitely would have been considered low functioning by Leo Connor, like ended up becoming a world traveler and a bank teller and a very happy guy. Yeah. Um, and, and over and over again, I saw people, you know, I remember actually I spoke to uh, a man who had been diagnosed by Leo Connor himself. And I said, uh, what was Connor's advice to your mother? And uh, he said, well, uh, Connor told my mother to put me in an institution. Oh so she goodness. did. Okay. Wait. So she did. Yale. Oh, good, good, good. Good. <laughs> yeah. Good. <laughs> good. Yeah. Great. So, you know, not all autistic kids will be able to go to Yale, but, yeah. you know, it's uh, over and over again I was impressed by um, people exceeding the terrible predictions that were, you know, were being made for them and yeah. really figuring out a, a path so that they could excel. Great. No, I know I have one very close friend who has a young man who is 11 now and he was he was absolutely completely nonverbal. He lost uh, all speech by the time he was 18 months and they, they, they yeah. were told that he most likely would not speak again. And he's now 11 and for the last two years he talks as, as eloquently as you or I and he makes phone calls and he does all kinds of things that that we he, that that they initially thought he wouldn't be able to do. So I suppose the message is never to um I, I suppose never to allow a child to fit into that box that they're asked to fit into to allow them to try and break break out of it too, do you know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um could I could I give a a shout out to two people, one of whom is alive and the other who isn't. 100%. Uh, who might be listening somehow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the person who's not alive is uh, my grandma, my great-grandmother, Lily O'Connell from County Cork. Oh, fabulous. Um, yep. She was my great-grandmother, and uh, unfortunately I never met her because I was too young when she died. But um, if you're out there, <laughs> great-grandmother, thank you. And then the other person is, I, I know an, uh, an Irish guy, I believe he lives in London, named uh, Ryan Hen uh, no, I'm sorry, in Dublin, um, named Ryan Hendry, who is a very, very bright and spunky and feisty autistic self-advocate in social media. And uh, reading his tweets is really a delight, and he's very inspiring. Um, so, Ryan, if you're out there, this is a call out from me. Oh, I've no doubt that he will be so, so impressed and so delighted that you have done. And I'm delighted that there's a saying here that all the all, everything that was ever good always came out of Cork. Cork. So you're 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 yeah. bred from greatness is the way I'll put it to you. <laughs> Great. Um, Thank you. Steve, I've literally got three questions left for you. Um, sure. I suppose the first is about employment. What do you think prospective employers should know and keep in mind when interviewing a person with autism and what accommodations would benefit the person with autism from interview stage right through to navigating the workspace? Well, you know, the problem uh, with um, uh, inter job interviews is that you're expected to do a lot of things that are particularly hard for autistic people to do. So the advice that you usually get when going into a job interview is, you know, like, sell yourself, strong handshake, yeah. look the person in the eye. You know, these are all things yeah. that are almost perversely, like, you know, things that are hard for autistic people to do. Something that, uh, a bit of advice that Temple gives uh, young autistic job seekers is let your work sell itself. Like, develop a portfolio of projects or, you know, a, a web page or something that can really allow 
you to show off the potential of your work to someone who uh, might potentially hire you. Um, I think that's important. I think that uh, the models of, you know, what they call in the corporate world onboarding um, that are being developed by companies like Specialistern and uh, 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 SAP, which is a German software conglomerate that has an autism at work program that is putting thousands of autistic people to work. Um, They focus on creating a circle of emotional support around the potential employee, and uh, they don't just do a face-to-face interview. They allow the person to solve potential problems. Uh, oh, they go, you know, if the person like likes to go bowling, they go out bowling with them, so the, you know their coworkers can get to know know them as a person. Um, these are all small accommodations, and uh, that can be very powerful and helpful for autistic people. But Great. here's the thing that no one knows really is that you know you hear about these efforts and you think, oh, how nice, you know, they're being charitable to uh, autistic people who you know find it hard to find work. Well, how generous of them. Actually, that's not at all how it works. What they find is that autistic employees tend to be very stable once they have a a situation that allows them to really express their strengths. And they're very loyal, and they're not like, you know, social climbing like many non-autistic employees. And so it actually saves companies like SAP money to hire autistic people because they stay in their jobs longer and don't have to be retrained yeah. uh, as often. And so it's not charity. It's about boosting value for your stockholders. Yeah. It's good the head business. The at work told me. Yeah. And that, that's, that's, I think, a really important. Don't think of it as charity. No. Think of it as actually doing something for the bottom line of your company. Yeah. Um, to hire a more diverse workforce. Perfect. So that's, that's one thing I would say. Yeah. Um, perfect. Steve, as parents, um, do you have any pointers on how you feel we could best support our children's development at home? Well, just remember that your, your child is always listening, even if they can't speak, okay. for one. You know, that's a big thing. Um, you know, they may, they may not understand everything, but they probably understand more than you think. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, just uh, don't stop believing in your child's potential and let your, let your child's own path of personal growth dictate what's next for them. Good. You know, Good. Um, look for other parents who can support you in respecting your child's needs uh, and respecting your child's development. And, you know, all parents struggle with the fact that the kid is, you know, growing up on some path that they didn't predict or whatever, you know, that's just being a parent, you know. But um, uh, I would say that, you know, find a community that you can build around the child that includes, you know, it's very helpful for young autistic people to have autistic friends, if that's possible. Um, And so, you know, give your child every chance that they can have. And that's not... You know, that's not to say go spend twenty thousand dollars on some miracle yeah. treatment or something. You know, but just respect, love, you know, unconditional love. Um, uh, I would say that's the most important message. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, tell me, Steve. Finally, following on from the the parents and educators and all that, what's the one piece of advice you'd give anybody to make their own autism journey as easy as possible? Well, uh, sorry, no. I would say that, yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult one, but I think it is. I think it's a very important it, one to ensure that people it are is, yeah. spoken to directly. Uh, right. I would say, you know, you kind of have to believe in your own potential, even if the people in your environment are not sending you that message. And, you know, the only reason why I feel, um, you know, like I can say something like that is because when I was in high school, homosexuality was considered a mental illness. And, you know, people would be institutionalized and arrested for being gay. Now I'm a very happily married gay man. Uh, But, you know, when I was in junior high school and everything, I was getting beaten up almost every day uh, for kids who, by kids who, you know, would call me bad names for being gay. And my parents sent me to a therapist for the cure and all this. You know, so I had to believe in myself uh, even when nobody else around me did. Okay. And one way that I did that was by reading the writings of older gay writers, like the poet Allen Ginsberg. And now there are books that are written by autistic people 
um, like Loud Hands is an anthology of great writing by autistic people. Um, and, uh, you know, so if you're, if you're stuck in a place where people don't believe in you, you know, re- if you can, you know, read the voices of older autistic people and do what you can to believe in yourself and your own potential and let that be the lighthouse that guides you to safety. Perfect. Steve, thank you so, so much for coming on the show today. I'm absolutely, I'm honoured and I'm privileged that you took time out of your schedule to speak with me. And thank you so, so much for sharing all this information with my listeners. I've no doubt that even in listening in, um, people will ha- will feel better equipped and will feel hope. So thank you so, so much for today. Well, thank you. And I want to say something else. I'm, I'm actually just starting another book project. I'm not going to talk about what it's about. Okay. But it's not about autism, but it's, ju- it's very new. But it will probably take me to Ireland oh, wow. uh, for, for, for research next year. So if there are any autism organizations that would like to host me, you know, for a talk in Ireland, uh, you know, in, in the spring or whatever, get, get in touch with my publisher. I'd love to come. Fantastic, uh, Steve. I, I, what I might do, actually, is I might touch base with you on Twitter and we might try and coordinate something around that. That would be absolutely amazing and it would be absolutely wonderful to meet you in person. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. Steve, really thank you. It. No, thank you so, so much. And I've no doubt I will speak to you again, hopefully in, in physical presence in the springtime. Absolutely. Sounds great. Okay, thanks a million, Steve. Take care. Bye.